All right, Evan, we are live whenever you are ready to begin. Um, I would like to mention you can head over to learn.permethos.com if you'd like to support the All right, show. Evan, we are live whenever you are ready to begin. Um, I would like to mention you can head over to. Uh, I need to meet that. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> you can head over to uh, learn.permethos.com. You'll see progressive farming with Evan Folds. It's $29 a year, and you get access to all of the recordings. And thank you for joining us today. How's that look? Wonderful. Perfect. All right. Well, I'm uh, going to print this off while I introduce here. So thanks, everybody, for being here. We had a little bit of a pause there as we got organized. We got some really good content coming down the pipeline. And we've been talking about uh, the mineral component of bioenergetic agriculture, which basically is a, uh, an acknowledgement of the physical, mineral, biological, and energetic capacities of a living system. And what I found is that that's a very good platform to kind of connect the dots conversationally towards action of every facet of life. Uh, think about it like four legs of a chair. Um, so what we've talked about is the physical realm, which is the plant itself, the soil structure, uh, the mineral component, which gets into fertilization, base saturation, mineral balance, soil testing, and the like. And what we're pivoting to here is the biological realm, which is uh, soil food web, composting, compost tea, all those good things. So what we're going to talk about today is uh, the soil food web. Um, and there'll be about I think three or four weeks of information on this. So what we're going to do here is just kind of dream a little bit about what we do and don't know um, in regards to soil, the biological realm and soil, and uh, just, just kind of set the groundwork for what we can do to influence it. Um, primarily things like composting, compost tea. Uh, and uh, so we'll get into the guts of that in the, in the coming weeks. So the, the first real connection to make is that microbes are everywhere right i'm uh you know uh, i'm imagining that you know where you guys are at in your evaluation of agriculture is is hip to this concept but it i ran a garden center for 15 years called progressive gardens uh, we did hydroponics and organic gardening but one of my uh passions is the kind of the energetic capacity of living systems because i think it's the most ignored and in a lot of respects the most important um you know life force this concept, a uh, loose concept, is, is kind of a way of talking about it. Um, but the, the soil food web is, is kind of the new kid on the block in terms of mainstream agriculture. And you see a lot of the big agricultural companies gravitating towards the biological realm. They tend to do that from a very application-specific singular microbe or hand-selected microbe stance. We know 5% of bacteria and 10% of fungi at the rate of discovery. So the idea that we can somehow imagine what to put into a product to make it a food web type approach is really uh, not possible. So the angle that my company takes is diversity and it's unknown diversity uh, for the reasons that I just stated. Um, but it's important to connect how fundamental uh, microbes are for soil. They make soil what it is. Uh, I always like to try to you know, make the point in a nutshell by you know, try drinking a beer without yeast, right? It's not a beer. Same goes for cheese or kombucha or vinegar or bread. Um, there's, incidentally, there's a really fascinating episode of uh, The Cooked show, uh, you can find it on Netflix, that was done by Michael Pollan, it's episode three about air, that discusses uh, the leavening of bread and, and, and how that process is defined by uh, the right uh, uh, microbes. Uh, so, you know, check that out if you're inclined. Uh, and you probably heard the stats, there's more, you know, microbial cells in and on in the healthy human body than there are human cells which is completely mind blowing, kind of makes you squirm a little bit. Uh, so, you know, this reality is a really easy bridge to the importance of microbes in the soil. Now, different microbes perform different processes, but the very fundamental reality is that soil cannot be what it is capable of being without a diverse food web present. Uh, I saw this quote on, I don't even know this guy, uh, but I didn't want to give him credit because it, it really hit home for me. Nature never had a non-microbial moment. And if you can really kind of internalize that, what we'll talk about through this talk here is, you know, organic gardening is really about feeding microbes, what they have to be there to be fed. 
And that, in my experience as an agricultural consultant, is probably the number one mistake made. Just take a lawn care company. You know, they're chemically minded. They're trained as such, like a doctor going to school for medicine as opposed to nutrition. And they're doing those motions. Their clients are like, give us some organic options. So they switch to an OMRI listed chicken manure that was made by gut microbes. And there's no soil microbes in the product. So they're, they're performing an, an organic process, but they're not growing the capacity of the soil to do it for us. And that's really the potential of this. Organics is more expensive because you use a, you know, a more expensive fertilizer and arguably get a better result. But you have to fertilize the soil for the life of the soil if the engine in the soil is not uh, capable of doing that for us. So the potential of, of true organic and what I like to call bioenergetic agriculture is to kick the start of the soil, inoculate it with a complete food web, grow those microbes to the capacity where we can wean ourselves off the fertilizer. Um, imagine a forest that grows trees with none, right? So the strength of the soil is, is really not being leveraged to our benefit. Uh, you know, even Da Vinci, back in, I think this was the 15th century, you know, we know more about the movement of celestial bodies than about the soil underfoot. I think that's probably true to say to this day, uh, which is kind of incredible if you think about it. So there's a concept called the rhizosphere, and this is kind of, you know, as far removed from the food web as, as we'll go, um, but it's it's a good term to really encapsulate what, what happens at the, the interface of the the tissue of the plant and the soil surrounding the roots. Uh, and you can see from this diagram, the rhizoplane is kind of you know, that interface itself. Uh, the endorhizosphere is the plant tissue. The ectorhizosphere is outside of the plant tissue and microbes communicate across this bridge. Um, you may be familiar with mycorrhizal fungi. There's endomycorrhizae and ectomycorrhizae. Endomycorrhizae actually pierces the root and acts as an extension of the root without the plant having to expend the energy to grow it, the fungal hyphen are doing it for them, uh, solubilizing nutrition and delivering it to the plant return for plant exudates, which can be you know, up to 50% of the energy plants undertake in photosynthesis is pushed through the roots, it's what's called an exudate. Uh, it's a sugar meal for a microbe. So you know, that, that process is basically wasted when there's nothing there to reciprocate. So if you've never used mycorrhizal fungi, it's highly selective to plant species, but it creates tremendous growth benefits in plants. It, it also happens to be one fraction of the fungal trophic level in the soil. So by no means is it a complete food web product either, but uh, it is probably most well known because of its symbiotic, direct symbiotic relationship. Uh, the ectomycorrhizae doesn't pierce the root, but kind of encapsulates the surrounding the roots to protect it from disease and things like that. T typically doesn't give you a lot of growth benefit, but both have their role. Um, so in, it, within the rhizosphere uh, is, is where the magic happens. Uh, these are some images uh, of electron microscope. Um, the one on the right is an exudate. So you can see the sugar meal being pushed through the roots. Uh, the left is just the aggregation of the rhizosphere itself. Uh, but it's kind of cool to see these things in, in reality. Um, you know, that they, they're they very real and they're beyond our ability to see them, which, you know, in my experience doing this and talking about this is really the reason people don't pay attention to it, right? I mean, I live in North Carolina and in my garden center, people would come in having never visited our store before and thought microbes were hand sanitizer or antibiotics. You know, there was just no connection to begin with. The soil was alive and needed to be nurtured as such. I, I mean, frankly, I, ran, I graduated from a major university and thought more or less the same thing. And I had a biology degree. So um, that's a lot of where I generate the passion to do these kinds of things, because, you know, it, discovering uh, the magic that happens in the soil and the way that it does was, was, has really changed my life. Uh, so I, I try to build a bridge for others to have the same experience. Um, so, you know, just a couple more images, you know, this is a, uh, yeah, rhizobia um, and also mycorrhizal association um, in the root system. Um, again, just another good visual to see, you know, these things are very, very small. I think something like 500,000 bacteria can fit in the period of the end of sentence in a book just for scale. It's totally nuts. Um, so, you know, with that introduction, um, just a statement of fact, uh, microbes make soil. It happens that a lot of what soil is, is the guts of microbes. Uh, as we'll talk about in a second, you have different trophic levels in the food web and the shredders, the 
the apex predators, the nematodes are eating the smaller organisms. And as they shred that up, it builds up the humic content of the soil. And um, that's plant food in, in a nutshell. Uh, so it, it's, you know, this, this steam you see coming off this compost pile right here is uh, indicative of the activity of the microbes uh, in, in the system. It doesn't come from ambient heat. You can have a steaming compost pile in the middle of winter um, if it's properly inoculated. And the reason is the activity in the pile is generating almost a, a frictional uh, heat, if you want to think of it that way, that uh, heats the pile up and serves the purpose of sanitizing what you don't want in there and then processing the organic matter through to uh, chemically to uh, humus or the, the lowest decomposed state of organic matter. So humus is a really interesting conversation. As I mentioned, it, you know, it's perfect plant food. It's what's called colloidal. Uh, that word is uh, difficult to define, but it's, it's basically the interface of a solid and a liquid, meaning uh, it's not just water, but the solution is uh, homogeneous. And they just think about it like uh, ocean water. It's got all kinds of mineral salts in there, elemental salts, but you can't see them. And they don't settle out over time. So the solution is colloidal because it's basically as refined as it's going to get and it's a homogeneous solution or substance. Uh, you could call worm castings uh, colloidal, for example. Um, so it's also extremely dynamic. Um, there's actually a study and I've provided a source there that I'll put it in the show notes as well for you to kind of peruse on your own time if you'd like that I think it was back in 2016, it was quite controversial, and I think it was intended to be, created a good conversation, in my view, that stated, you know, humus doesn't exist. And the point wasn't to say it was an erroneous idea, but to say that it's not possible to define. Um, and it's, you know, one of the interesting things that you find through that is the idea of how we measure humus. You know, when you get a soil test from a lab, Typically, you have to ask the lab, uh, respectively, who you're working with, but typically organic matter is measured as humic content rather than the leaves in the forest. It's what's been taken through the process by microbes into that plant food humic colloidal form. So within that, the way we measure it is we actually, this process was developed uh, a long time ago. I don't remember the exact year, but it, was, it hasn't been refined since because there's not really anything to refine uh, technologically but they, they approach it with a pH, a very alkaline pH solution of like 13, which is very caustic and disruptive. Um, and they separate the humic content from the rest of the material and measure it accordingly. So what that basically means is that there's no way to study humus while it's in the soil environment, which is important to understand. You know, nature is, is the forest, not the tree, right? And how the interactions occur is really the part that's most important. And the most difficult one to measure, admittedly. Um, so some, somewhat of you know, what we try to do through this conversation in bioenergetic agriculture is kind of get you to imagine these things in a dynamic way rather than wanting to put our finger on the exact data point that tells us what's relevant. We want to in inspire the system to do what it is uh, it can do in, in a, on a higher level. So th this study was really kind of interesting because people were like, well, what do you mean it doesn't exist? Sure it does. And, and there's, of course, they're speaking from their conventional understanding of what it is, which is as good as anybody else has, uh, mind you. Um, but it, what it did do is create a conversation around uh, the dynamic nature of humus. And so it's very difficult to study in, in its, uh, in its uh, essence there. Um, so... Uh, Wanted to show you a quick intro from this guy named Graham Sate. He's from Australia. And this is a 20 minute tech TED talk, which we won't go through today, but he, he talks about it. And I want to introduce you to him because I, I think a lot of his work and just show you kind of where he's coming from dealing with this on an international level. Uh, so take a look at this. Okay. It's a pleasure to be here with so many passionate people. I've spent the last 20 years of my life researching and sharing information linked to um, the links between soil health, human health, and planetary health. And I'll continue with that sharing here today. I was about two weeks or three or four weeks ago, actually, I was on the steps of, of City Hall in LA speaking to a large group of climate change activists. And following that talk, uh, I got flooded with people many of them asking the same question. They were asking, what was that word 
And I immediately assumed that they were referring to a word that I'd used called mycorrhizal, which is really something of a spelling bee special. But to my surprise, the word they were seeking was the word humus. And for someone who is so passionate about the subject, as you'll soon learn, uh, it was something of a shock to realise that people have become so divorced from the source of their food that they weren't even familiar with the word. And this is people who are trying to save the planet. And so we'll begin by talking about what is humus. Um, interestingly, if we look at the etiology of this word, we find that the words humus and human mean the same thing. They mean of and for the earth. And interestingly, the word humility means exactly the same thing. And ironically, it's our lack of humility that has seen us in our constant quest to master nature that has really um, brought us pretty much to the brink. So uh, I'll let you take that to the end there on your own time, but he makes a great point. Um, and, you know, I'm going to make it in a similar way. Um, you know, the root of human humility, humus, uh, and humble uh, are all inextricably tangled there. Um, and it's how it all works together and the reverence that we bring to it that allows it to work the way that it is. And I use the word allow literally, um, you know, most of progressive agriculture is getting the human out of the way. Um, we, we, in our uh, authority, tend to undermine what we would want if we were asked. I use the word deprutive. You know, it's, it's fertilizing a crop to increase the yield on its face is a productive human endeavor. But what we do is take advantage of the soil and end up with pest and disease and all of the things that we try to chase around through a toxic, toxic rescue chemistry approach. So, you know, making that connection up front, I think is really important. And, you know, you also have to understand that in researching humus to humble yourself, uh, you know, humus is, is not a definable substance. Um, it's, it's like saying, uh, you know, seawater or uh, frankly, like saying water. You know, water is never the same in two different places because it holds different materials. It's the universal solvent. Uh, so we have, you know, different uh, capacities of water almost exponentially, but we've got one water, one word for it. Uh, so, you know, it, in my experience, coming to these sorts of realizations allows us to kind of let go of the uh, motivation to figure it all out. Uh, Rudolf Steiner, who's been a big influence to me uh, in my life, he was known to say, the more comfortable you are with not knowing, the more you know. And I think that there's a lot of value in that because, you know, in reality, the further you look into nature, the more questions we, we generate. Um, and that happens to be a very fascinating place to reside because as soon as you got it all figured out, what are you going to do next, right? Um, so, you know, consider that the opposite of balance is balance. And this is kind of, a, it's almost a riddle. A friend of mine said that to me and it took me a minute to uh, pondering to really see the point that he was making. Uh, but nature seeks this by design. It, it's got a momentum towards this balance that the human can steer in one way or the other. Uh, conventional agriculture steers it away from balance in a homogeneous monocrop type fashion. Uh, more permaculture techniques and, you know, bioenergetic techniques, biodynamic techniques, whatever, you know, you're, you're, um, position there um, are, are really seeking balance and diversity, you know, that, and that's really kind of as simple as you can make it. If you can focus on those two principles, you're going to end up in a good place. The question is really how quickly can we get there with the analytics that we do derive? Uh, so if you recall back from our soil testing moment, uh, maybe a month or so ago, you know, the soil testing you get from the lab I just did a, a, I'm doing a job up in, in New York and they sent me their soil testing, you know, and they were in the posture that, that they had done their deed and gotten the analysis. They didn't really know what to, to read from it. The lab didn't give them any feedback and they had looked for seven elements. This was a state extension service. Um, I believe it was Cornell. Um, and so just to give you a, a, a numbers based uh, posture there, the, the soil testing we do through our fertility management services looks for 22 elements. That's actually more than what's considered essential. Um, so we look for things like cobalt and silica and molybdenum that are outside the realm of, of typical have to have essential elements. <clears throat> and it, so it doesn't take more much to imagine that, you know, looking for what the plant has to have is relevant. That's more than what, you know, most authorities, extension labs look for, but it doesn't take much to imagine that a plant wants much more, right? 
So our inability to know that with the authority that we ask ourselves to generate through the scientific method really results in us ignoring that aspect of the conversation <clears throat> simply because we can't figure it out. Um, and, and Western science and modern science and Western medicine and you know, conventional agriculture don't do very well with that concept. <clears throat> they really need to boil it down to a schematic that they can put in the textbook that a teacher can teach. And frankly, the reality there is if you only know what you're taught, you're going to know very little uh, at all. Uh, what most of us out there are doing is having experiences that create the expertise that we need. What we try to do and what I try to do with the work that, that we do is, uh, you know, create a bridge to help understand how to work with that in some fashion. Um, so it's very interesting work. Um, and so this, this kind of thought here was something that was given to me by a friend of mine named Stuart Lundy. He's a, a biodynamic farmer in Accomack, Virginia, uh, Eastern Shore. Uh, probably the, the most, uh, most authority in biodynamic agriculture, and I would say beyond biodynamic agriculture that I know. And I'd, I'd love to invite him on the program at some point because he's way beyond me in, in my ability to um, harness the, the kind of the energetic realm that I've been referencing. Um, but he broke it down in this way that I thought was really valuable. You know, humus has been, re is the result of, of the decomposition of organic matter into the tiniest particles. And they're there as a decomposition process. Think of like breathing in, ready to be built up into a living system. Uh, and think about that as breathing out, for example. The earth breathes through the equinoxes. Today is the summer solstice. It's the longest day of the year. So from now on, the days get shorter and the earth is breathing in again. In the winter, all of the energy is in the earth. In the summer, all of the energy is expressed. With that reality, you can actually work with that with field sprays and very relevant uh, and documented, um, almost homeopathic approaches. Uh, so that that's fascinating. But what he, what he said was, you know, those those materials have been broken down into humus and they're ready. They just need a nudge to be built back up to, into, through that life force process that I was referencing. And we'll get into that in more detail in the future. Um, but you think that, you know, from an energetic standpoint, the parent, parent plant has been digested. The energy that they held is, is retained in that material if uh, worked with properly. That's basically biodynamic composting in a nutshell. And they radiate forces that can be lost if the process is, is adulterated, but they can also be leveraged. And, and Steiner calls, called these forces formative forces. And it turns out that water actually consolidates these forces. And that's basically what homeopathy is in a medicinal stance. It's also what you're doing with the 500 and the 501 spray in biodynamics. <clears throat> you're imploding water, which when you have water imploding on itself, makes it vulnerable to those energies and remember them for lack of a better word. And when the water retains those vibrations, you can then spray the frequencies to the field. Kind of far out, right? But think about the field like a symphony. And you don't hear the individual instrument until it's out of tune, right? Well, think about that like the, the, the pest infestation or the disease. So what you're really doing is affecting the space or the etheric body of the farm as opposed to the material physical body, which is basically where conventional agriculture and even organic agriculture resides solely. Um, so I, I could go off for, on that uh, if, for a bit, but I'll, I'll just kind of wet the whistle for some of the things that we'll be talking about in the future in regards to how to leverage those kinds of processes. Uh, but it's a very special uh, process here that we're talking about and really one that we can't put our finger on um, very directly. Um, so, you know, the soil food webs are community organisms uh, that live their lives in the soil. Uh, it's complex. Uh, it's in interactive dynamic scenario as we've described um, and basically food webs transfer the energy between species in an ecosystem these are called trophic levels <laughs> so think about it like all the fish in the sea you know you, the, the strength is in of the diversity of the system when you start to remove the sharks from the system then fish are a parasite I mean, that's a, a rough analogy, whether that would happen is experimental and let's not do that. But um, the bottom line is that the system re re uh, relies on itself to, for the big fish to eat the little fish. Um, and so within that capacity, it's pretty easy to understand what's happening in the soil. So I wanted to introduce you to uh, the players. Uh, this is a, a graphic. And as you can see, you've got the organic matter, the leaves falling in the forest. You know, the trees don't eat the leaves. They eat what the microbes make out of it, right? That's composting. 
we just give it a name and put it in a spot. And very rarely do we add the diversity of microbes that are uh, really needed to produce utmost value in that process. People tend to just go through the motions and turn it, assuming all the microbes are there. And what they're doing is just oxidizing the organic matter. Um, they're, they're making mulch, you know, and it's not a harmful thing. It's just not going to give you the result that you, you should expect. Uh, so the microbes do the work. Again, that beer is not a beer without the yeast. It's a fundamental definition of what soil is. So you can see the, the, the primary consumers of this organic matter chemically are fungi and bacteria. They work primarily through enzymatic activity. Uh, they manufacture enzymes that catalyze the breakdown of that organic matter. And then you have the secondary consumers uh, or the shredders as they're known, the protozoa and the nematodes that tend to eat the lower organisms. And then you got the organisms we can start to see, you know, the springtails, the mites, the spiders, the, the worms. You know, people wanna throw worms in their garden and their soil's dead because they got it from, you know, a bulk provider that doesn't know what the soil food web is. And the worms want to run for the hills, you know, because there's nothing alive in the soil. Uh, the irony is if you, if you start with kind of the plankton of the food web, the bacteria, and you get that right, it's going to bring the worms to that situation because they're not necessarily eating the dead root or the dead leaf. They're eating what's eating the dead root or the dead leaf. So again, that, that thought form can really kind of re recalibrate how we approach our environments. Um, so, you know, we discussed trophic levels. Those are life levels, bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and nematodes. The goal is humus. Think of the microbes like construction workers. This analogy really works um, for me. Um, and, and because, you know, once you get hit to microbes, the idea is, well, I can just spray some diverse microbes on my property and they can fix everything. Well, they might move a micrometer in their lifetime. They don't jump over the fence, right? So it's really important for us to add that consciously to a developed property particularly, but also chemically treated property and do it consistently. You can't build a neighborhood in a day. You got to build the foundation. You got to build the framing and then the electrical and so on. So within that reality, it's about the consistency of application. The more you can bring it one time and the more often you do it, the faster they build the neighborhood. Uh, so the analogy really, really does work in that capacity. Uh, we discussed enzymes, and most microbes don't have a mouth. Parasitic uh, lesionous nematodes do. One irony there is that 1% of nematodes are parasitic. The vast majority of them are beneficial as nutrient cyclers and shredders. So, you know, people pay attention to nematodes in a negative way because they're experiencing the damage that they're doing, and they're taking for granted the good things that the beneficial nematodes are doing. Uh, so I always find that ironic because when I connect with a conventional farmer and say the word nematode, he's like, whoa, why don't we want nematodes in our soil? And it's just an indirect indication of how far we've gotten away from what soil actually is. Um, so that's a, a kind of a scary image, though, but that's an electron microscope, so it's not going to take your finger off. Um, so, you know, within that, I wanted to talk through some of the, the, the microtrophic levels. You know, we saw the, the framework earlier. I'm sure you get the idea of the of the, the food web involved in the soil, but I, I wanted to show you a, a couple of them and give you some kind of stats around scale uh, for this. So, you know, the, the bacteria are the plankton of the food web. Uh, I mentioned earlier, 500,000 bacteria can fit in the period in a book, which, you know, look at a book if you got one next to you and try to imagine how to fit 500,000 of anything in there. It's totally nuts. Uh, you know, again, there's more bacteria cells on a human body than human cells. Um, and, you know, they work through enzymes um, and they feed off of exudates along with fungi uh, from the plant. So, you know, artificial materials aren't just judged from a toxicity level. What the artificial fertilizers, for example, would do is feed the plant, not the soil. And it really kind of, when you break it down in a big picture, it's that simple. Uh, organic gardening is, is about feeding the soil, not necessarily, not just the plant, because it also does feed the plant, especially if it's in a soluble form. But if you use something like a meal, like alfalfa meal or, uh, you know, bone meal or something along those lines, it doesn't just melt. It, it needs to be biologically digested. It's not like Osmoco synthetic that, you know, has a time release on it. Um, it's, it's a raw organic matter. And again, that leaf in the forest can't just melt into plant food. It has to be taken there by these microbes. Uh, so they, they, you know, the importance of them can't be uh, overstated. So this is uh, our compost tea recipe under the microscope. And as you can see, there's all sorts of things. This is kind of, a, I think, a 400 times, if I'm not mistaken there, I'd have to check on that. But you can see all of the life involved. And this is uh, compost tea is when you grow the microbes as opposed to just uh, receiving what the compost gives you. Composting is an act of concentrating 
the the natural process on the forest floor about turning it, idealizing the ratios and managing it. Uh, compost tea concentrates compost. So it allows you to liquefy for application uh, and it takes the microbial population to a level that nature can't produce on her own because you've idealized those conditions. So it allows us to play catch up uh, in that regard. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's kind of cool to see this. We used to play a loop of this on in our garden center. And instead of trying to paint the picture verbally, we just say, look, people go, wow, you know, I never even knew that this was under my feet. And it, literally it's another universe. Uh, so it's kind of cool to think about. Um, what you have is uh, fungi is this kind of the step up. Um, and they're also, you know, the primary consumers decomposing organic matter. I've mentioned mycorrhizal fungi. You can kind of see a little image of that on the right there if you can actually see it. Um, but consider a teaspoon of, of healthy compost has 40 miles of fungal hyphae in it. Again, the, the scale of this is, is cool because it's just like, it's like trying to think about a trillion dollars, right? It's just off the charts. And there's all sorts of, uh, you know, I, I mentioned we know 10% of, of fungi at the rate of discovery. So we're constantly discovering more. Uh, bacteria was 5%. So we know very little. But um, what we do know is, is relevant. Uh, what we don't want to do is stop at what we do know and not imagine what we don't and have that humility towards it, right? Uh, it turns out that the largest organism in the world is a honey mushroom in eastern Oregon. It's 2,200 acres uh, from a singular DNA species that's just grown over the years, uh, which is kind of an amazing stat. And if you've never found Paul Stamets, I just mentioned that for, for your information. I'll put that in the show notes as well. He, he wrote a great book called Mycelium Running that uh, just takes a view of how fungi can save the world. He also has a really great TED talk that um, I'll make myself a note to, to add to the um, show notes as well. But he, uh, it's titled how, My, how Fungi Can Save the World. And he goes through from a reclamation standpoint in terms of filtering water. Uh, he goes through um, you know, how they are symbiotic to plants. Uh, a lot of that relevance comes from the bottlenecks of history where you have, you know, ice ages that stress the ecosystem and the, the organisms that can develop a symbiotic relationship and teammates um, kind of win the day and come out the other side. So what that results in is 99.9% .9 of plants uh, having a direct symbiotic relationship with a certain strain of fungi that is collectively known as mycorrhizae. Um, but again, that's, that's just a, a sliver of the fungal realm. It's not you know, mycorrhizae is not mutually exclusive to, to fungi. Uh, it's a, a fraction of the fungal realm. Uh, so, you know, definitely, you know, there's a, an abundance of information coming out with new research of how, you know, the forest can speak to itself through the fungal hyphae. A lot of people equate it, I think, accurately to kind of the synapses of the earth, uh, the brain of the earth. You'll even find people that tell you they came from out of outer space. Which is kind of cool who knows whether it's true or not but uh, the idea being that there is an intelligence in the soil and the fungal hyphae tend to be the neural network of that uh, so it's it's highly important and you know no-till farming is basically leveraging this reality it takes time for this food web to get up to speed and you know towards the end of the talk i'm going to show you a study that was done it's really fascinating towards that point this this development of microbes does not happen overnight and it can be disturbed. I don't think critically so. I don't think it's going to, if you till your soil, it doesn't defeat the purpose of using compost tea, for example. It's going to mitigate the strength of the soil and its ability to perform your fertilization for you on some level. Uh, but a lot of that is also defined by how big your exchange capacity is. And, you know, on a soil test, if you're above a seven, you should be able to grow crops without any fertilizer input, assuming the mineral balance is, is, is complete and diverse. If you're below a seven, like you are in my region, we have really sandy soils, you're going to struggle with that. You're going to have to supplement with some level of fertilization. And the goal being to grow the capacity of the soil to hold uh, energy, uh, electrical uh, exchange capacity, uh, balance, and balance the calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium, you know, all the micros, basically 90% of the essential elements are all positively charged. The soil is negatively charged. They hold each other. Think of it like a gas tank. Um, so what the job of a progressive grower uh, and what our fertility management services do is take an inventory of what's being held and then manage the balance within that. And the cool irony of that is it, if you weren't with us in our mineral talk is that when you get that balance within a, a general range, the pH is always where you want it to be. 
which make the connection most of conventional agriculture is very pH driven. The assumption being that the, when the pH is right, everything's right with the world. And that's just simply not the case. Um, so a lot of, you know, you, hopefully you're connecting some of these dots in, in a general form and, you know, make the connection that, you know, uh, you know, just as I said it up front, you know, if you subscribe to, to this channel, you're going to get uh, all the playbacks that you want and all, all of the uh, content that we've developed to date. So, you know, we appreciate the support uh, if you're inclined to do that. And you can also feel free to reach out to me at evidentfarmprogressive.com. That's my email, uh, which you have access to me through that $29 a year uh, approach as well. Uh, so do keep that in mind. Um, so just a quick video of kind of the uh, fungal mycelia. It's, it's really neat to see this. Uh, there's another video that I have that, that shows bacteria following uh, the cytoplasmic flow, as it's called, uh, basically information and physical uh, material and plant food being moved from one region of the soil to the other through the fungal hyphae network. Uh, so it's a, this is a literal thing. This is not just a concept. I mean, you can see it right there. Uh, it's really cool to look at. Check that out. It's hard to describe how small that is, right? It's, uh, it's totally amazing. So protozoa are the next big trophic level or life level category in the soil food web. Um, they are uh, single celled organisms. They are considered to be some of the first uh, uh, animals that's kind of what the name means. Now, you know, if you look at the tree of life, we talked about it as best we could in the past. Uh, it's very difficult to define this in any kind of black and white uh, posture, but um, safe to say that the, the nutrient cycling capacity of protozoa is critical to the food web. Um, they're known as shredders because they're not cycling the primary uh, organic matter into humus. Uh, they are shredding up the bacteria and the fungi to create that humus, as we talked about earlier. Uh, so they're extremely diverse. We know of 50 different thousand types, uh, 50,000 different types, I should say. Um, and they basically have three uh, categories, uh, amoeba, which you may have heard about from science class, if you, you don't remember, flagellates and ciliates. And, and these organisms comprise the protozoa uh, domain. Um, so, you know, again, the, the definition of these life levels is, is very uh, shifty, um, but it's safe to say that, you know, they are doing some really critical work for the soil. And you, you can see that here. This is also from our compost tea recipe. You can see the cilia uh, that creates the mobility on the, on the protozoa there. Uh, and it's almost, you know, like a cow grazing. You know, it's and if you look really close, you can kind of see the flow being created around its mouth. And it's basically just moving bacteria into its organism uh, and pooping it out. Uh, nutrient cycling, cycling at its finest. Um, so, again, re really cool to see these types of things. It's uh, not something that you can see with the naked eye. So the last category, uh, or what we'll call the apex predator of the food web, is are nematodes. Uh, I mentioned earlier that you know most nematodes are beneficial. I'm working on a project in Africa. There's an army worm uh, epidemic that is just they call them army worms because they basically eat everything as it crosses the field, and leaves the farmer with nothing. And in Africa, about 80% of farming is subsistence farming, is small growers growing for their families, and they grow maize or corn. Uh, and most of that goes to their animals, not look, unlike what we do here. And if they don't produce a crop, they can't sustain their animals and, and literally people are dying. And it's, it's really a critical situation over there. And the UN's gotten involved because most of these countries, I think it's in 14 countries now, and it just showed up in 1999 originally. And there's a new species uh, that's not the African army worm, but what's called the fall army worm that comes from South America that just found its way over there somehow last year. And uh, it's moving rapidly through the continent and our, I, I work with a company that has materials that are organic that can work on that scale. And it's very exciting because it's literally an opportunity to change the world um, in, in that capacity. And the approach that we're taking is, is a, an organic larvicide that we have um, combined with beneficial nematodes. There's one art aspect of the uh, life cycle that goes through the soil. It's when the caterpillar goes through its molting. And then when it's done eating, it goes down into the soil to 
to create the pupa uh, that then births the moth that flies off to a new field. So the thought is if we can contain the larvae above the soil and use the beneficial nematodes in the soil, that we've got a one, two pronged approach that can mitigate the problem from spreading. Um, so I you know, have a high level of confidence we're gonna be successful and we should be sending samples uh, in the next week or so, hopefully to, to get a proof of concept. So I was speaking with Josiah before the, the uh, talk here that you know, there's a lot more content along those lines in terms of case studies that, are, that will be coming down the pipeline as well. Um, so stay tuned for that. Um, but there, you know, there's, there's predatory nematodes that, um, as I was just describing, and there's parasitic nematodes. Parasitic nematodes are the ones that eat the plant. They tend to be an indication of an unhealthy food web. In other words, there's nothing else there to keep them in check. And, you know, I didn't put it in this presentation. I probably should have, but there's a really famous image, and, and I'm going to find it real quick because it's worthy. Um, this is a uh, A famous image of the um, food web. Let's see if I can find it here. This one here. So this is actually a parasitic nematode that's being captured by a beneficial fungi. So, you know, just kind of sit with that for a second. It's not about going to kill the target pests because doing that with conventional chemicals, for example, is going to kill everything else, right? And we're stuck in that vicious cycle. And, you know, I had this conversation locally. We got a bunch of flower farmers around us. And, you know, they, they view nematodes as bad and their angle is to try to kill them and they fumigate the soil and they do so, all sorts of crazy things uh, that frankly they have to do based on what they're being consulted with from the experts, uh, as we kind of talked about earlier. Uh, but the, the balance wins the day here. It, it, you know, the way you get rid of, of parasitic nematodes is by balancing them out with the, with the food web. Uh, the parasite very rarely is contamination or bad luck. It, it's simply just a matter of imbalance. So, Again, if you can internalize that process, the, the results that you're gonna get are only gonna get better with time. And it's gonna not only get rid of your issues, it's gonna result in, in stronger plants and stronger people. And that's really the whole point, right? Um, so if you, the lawn is a really easy way to make this point. You know, people have moles in their lawns. They'd come in my garden center when, I, when it was open and be red in the face because the lawn was just getting ripped to shreds by these moles that were having a field day. But the reality is a mole doesn't dig through the earth for nothing. It's, it's sonar sees a buffet of grubs and it's moving towards the, the meal. So by trying to get rid of the mole and not addressing the root cause and removing the buffet, even if you got the mole, his friend's coming right behind him, right? It's a never ending process. So um, treating the root of the problem, getting rid of the larvae is the way to go. Now let's say you used a synthetic larvicide. Well, you, maybe you can get rid of the grubs, but you're killing everything else and the grubs are just gonna make their way back uh, seasonally and maybe even sooner than that. So if you introduce beneficial nematodes, you can buy them actually. Uh, it looks like a little card about the size of your palm and it'll cover about 2,500 square feet, somewhere around 40, 50 bucks. And it's kind of like putting a bunch of sharks in the kiddie pool. It does a really good job of getting rid of the grubs, but unless you're adding the rest of the food web, when the food source runs out for the nematode and the dead soil, basically they die and you have to add them every single year. So the approach is to throw the sharks in the kiddie pool, get rid of the problem, follow that with compost tea from a diverse standpoint, set the food web up, and then you basically let put it on autopilot once you've built the neighborhood uh, to follow the construction worker analogy. Um, so, you know, they control things that can't be killed by chemicals, chinch bug, mole cricket, ground pearl. We deal with all three of those in our, in our area. We have really poor soil. And I've cure all of those, those issues just through my garden center, providing compost tea for people. Uh, so this is really not difficult. Uh, you could also talk about fleas uh, or fire ants. You know, nematodes uh, will work on those species. And then if you set the food web up and encourage that over time, you're going to mitigate basically all of those issues. Uh, so nematodes are very diverse. Um, there's, you know, 50,000 kinds of uh, protozoa. Uh, estimated 20,000 uh, species of nematodes. They're not as abundant in the soil, but that's by design of the food web, not unlike the shark or the lion on the plane and the zebras, right? That balance is what allows them to, to uh, subsist. Um, so, you know, trust that analogy makes sense. This is just what a, a grub looks like after it's been eaten um, by a parasitic or a predator nematode, I should say, not a parasitic one. Um, so all of these issues can be handled, and this, this is a pretty cool visual of a beneficial nematode. Looks like his foot's caught on the uh, 
the carpet there or something. I don't know. But uh, and you can see a, a, a protozoa in the bottom corner and also right there. Uh, I always think of grazing cows when I see them. It's kind of what they're about. But these organisms are eating the smaller organisms, not the organic matter directly. Uh, so again, pretty, pretty neat to see these guys in action. So with that, just a couple of stats. Um, you know, this is a teaspoon of native grassland estimates, obviously. Um, it would be even higher in a really high quality compost. Uh, but, you know, 600 to 800 million bacteria in a teaspoon, 10,000 species. 5,000 species of fungi, uh, miles of the mycelia, which are basically the tentacles of the fungal species, uh, fungal organism. 10,000 uh, individual protozoa, over 1,000 species, 20, 30 different nematodes, over 100 species, and a teaspoon of grassland soil. Uh, so you can see how abundant these things are. Uh, and, you know, I'm going to take that one step further. I always like to find a reason to bring up the book Secrets of the Soil. And I just wanted to read you a pa passage here. Um, so I had the book handy. And this is really mind blowing. It says, uh, so a single microbe reaching maturity and dividing within less than half an hour can in the course of a single day grow into 300 million more. And in another day to more than the number of human beings that have ever lived. As computed by Lynn Margulis and her son Dorian Sagan and their brilliant book Microcosmos, bacteria in four days of unlimited growth could outnumber all the protons and even all the quarks estimated by physicists to exist within the entire universe. That's almost too far out for me, to be honest with you. Uh, so that's why I read it out of the book. Um, but it's safe to say that it, you cannot quantify the potential of biological reproduction on a microscopic level. And if you can parlay that into an imagination of what you're doing in compost tea, for example, where you're aerating the water and actually actively growing those microbes through those idealized conditions, you can start to get a sense of how valuable that is to be able to inoculate your soil with the type of construction workers that are responsible for making soil what it is. Um, it's a, uh, it cannot be replaced by fertilizers. You cannot fertilize the soil into health. Uh, it just doesn't work like that. Uh, so microbes are also uh, very weird. And so I wanted to show you this quick clip of magnetotatic bacteria. This is kind of a... humor obviously a lab with a lot of time on their hands but i always find it interesting when I, I share that clip that when you see the bacteria orienting themselves to the magnetic field uh and, you know try to with that video have anybody tell you that energy is not real uh and, and relevant and influential in living systems there's always that outlier that like runs through the whole thing uh it's kind of funny but uh you know, yeah, so it's, there's a, a whole nother world in regards to how this stuff works. So, you know, kind of wrapping it up to 
kind of set the table for some of the, the coming weeks. Um, I always found, find this framework to be valuable and I've already mentioned it in some fashion, but you know, organic gardening is, is literally, if you boil it down, um, most people identify it as being cleaner, better for you, good for the earth and all that's really awesome. Um, but what it really is, is feeding microbes. Organic materials feed microbes, conventional, synthetic, man-made, uh, you know, artificial, whatever word you want to use, uh, don't. They feed the plant directly at the expense of the soil. Um, and if they don't, aren't toxic directly, they're bypassing the relevant and not feeding the soil. So if you really kind of connect to that, you know, organics is about feeding the microbes. The next step is that the microbes have to be there to be fed. So I mentioned that earlier about, you know, lawn, chemical lawn care companies converting to organics using organic fertilizer and dead soil. It's going to work better. It's going to be more expensive, but there's no capacity uh, to get the human out of the responsibility of growing plants. And frankly, that's not our responsibility uh, until we undertake the type of agriculture that obliterates the ability of the soil to do that for us. Um, so that construction worker analogy comes back around. So think of the organic fertilizers, organic materials you're using in your gardening are farming as the building materials, right? And think of the uh, enzyme capacity of the primary uh, decomposers, the bacteria and the fungi is defined by the number of diverse elements that are there for them to work with. It turns out that every earthbound element in the periodic table has an enzyme potential. So without all the elements there, it's like hiring microbes to build a house and giving them half the tools. They, they, they're not able to, to do their job in the way that they want to. Um, and that can manifest in disease, and pests, and all sorts of afflictions that we chase around with toxic chemicals. Um, you know, so it, it, again, that does, these analogies uh, I hope are helpful. Um, and it's really about diversity and balance and inoculation. Uh, th these organisms have to be there, and you know, again, they don't parachute in from somewhere else or just manifest proof out of thin air. They they need to be added, and it, I'll just highlight again the nature of property development. If you're a homesteader or you have uh, in a residential neighborhood to have an urban farm, you know, the idea of ripping your lawn up and planting a farm is, is great, and I'm do it. Uh, I have a farm yard project, farm a dash yard dot com. Check it out and sign up for their webinars and stuff, but. Um, what they're doing is basically, you know, there's a lot of outfits out there that are suggesting do that. And you get a lot of failure that happened all the time in my garden center. People would come from upstate New York or Ohio where they had the really good soil conditions and they could use their miracle grow and get away with it. And, you know, over time that's degeneration ensues, but you can get away with that for a period of time. And they move here and the soil's so poor, they did their, their process and, and the tomato plant just dies. Uh, what well, you just can't assume the soil is, is, uh, is there to be taken advantage of. Uh, and so you have to grow that capacity. So in a lot of ways, the poor nature of our soil locally allowed us to connect with people in a more immediate way because they really couldn't get away with doing the, the, the big box, you know, cheap fertilizer approach. Um, and they couldn't kill all the problems back created. Uh, so, you know, I, I guess on, on one hand that, that helped the message uh, that, that I've developed here, uh, connect with people, um, but it's really relevant anywhere uh, for that matter. Uh, so, you know, this, there's intelligence in the soils I mentioned earlier. Our goal is to get the human out of the way and nurture that. And there's a biodynamic farmer from Australia named Alexander Podolinsky. And he gave me an analogy in one of his lectures that I found in a book uh, of jelly pockets. And it's kind of a cool mind thought. You have a field, prairie, unadulterated by humans. And the process ensues in which the soil organizes itself deliberately. And you imagine these jelly pockets being the humus where the fertilizer is. And you imagine outside of that being uh, just water. And then you imagine a plant root differentiating between feeder roots and water roots. And when the sun comes over uh, in its full blast, then the plant's eating and drinking. And then when the sun is clouded, it may step off the photosynthesis and stop eating, but it needs to drink, right? So the, the plant can choose. Um, that ability to choose is obliterated when you use soluble fertilizer because there's nitrogen or whatever it is that you're using throughout the entire soil system, which can result in a higher rate of growth, but you're really just accomplishing obese plants. And based on the way we set agriculture up, they can actually imagine that they're winning uh, in that capacity, but for real people are not. Uh, so, you know, we'll cover the, the you know, we kind of say if it's not in the soils, not in the plants, not in the plants, not in the people. And without the diversity in the soil for the plant to have access and the microbes to, to produce, that diversity and intelligence, <clears throat> you're not getting a quality of plant that um, 
can justify human potential. Uh, quick stat, 1950 USDA data, it takes one apple to get the amount of iron that you need 26 apples for today. Just, you can't even eat that amount of caloric intake. You can't sit down and eat 26 apples, right? So that gives you a small window if you extrapolate across and a larger window of basically the root of modern degenerative and autoimmune disease. Um, we could sit here and figure it out. The question is, what do we do about it? And, uh, you know, your presence here today is part of it. So again, want to thank you for that. Uh, but sync out Podolinsky's work. He, he puts things in a really cool framework in regards to the biodynamics conversation. Another thing that I'll, I'll probably mention again next week is um, when we talk about composting is, uh, you know, all microbes are not the same as we've talked about, but uh, the same is true in regards to compost. The majority of the compost that's purchased on the market is just aged manure. Uh, a lot of it comes from horse tracks or cow manure, cow uh, feed lots or whatever it may be. And those, those organic materials are made by gut microbes. They're anaerobic. Um, the reason we turn a compost pile to make that connection is we want the aerobic organisms in a diverse fashion. So the idea is if you bring a bunch of manure together to compost it and you basically wait on it, because you know, there's no conscious effort to put soil microbes into the act activity. What you're really doing is off-gassing the nitrogen, which makes it not as hot. It's not gonna burn your plant, which is lost also as fertilizer potential. Um, but it, it makes the material uh, conducive to using it in a garden. The problem is when it's used in a garden that's not properly inoculated, the only benefit that comes from that is the solubility that came through the manure, the urea and the, the whatever is latent in a soluble form in the organic matter. The manure needs to be decomposed another step by soil microbes to make the full complex of that material available. So a cool connection to make is something like worm castings. If you're familiar with worm manure, it's like black gold, right? And the reason is that the, the gut microbes of a worm are soil microbes different than a cow, right? So it, it, that, that's one way of making sense of this. You don't have to compost worm castings again. It is humus by its very nature because it's created by the, the microbes that live in the soil because that's where the microbe itself lives. Um, so that's kind of a cool connection to make. So the last thought I wanted to throw at you here is the element of patience. Um, you know, we've been bred and conditioned from a young age in the modern world to want things yesterday. And that's the way conventional agricultural products have been created. Get rid of the weed uh, immediately. Uh, disease, kill it. Uh, pest, kill it. Mindset typically being I have bad luck and they flew by my neighborhood and landed on my plants. Well, it makes sense why people would want to go kill them um, from a victim standpoint. But the reality is it's an indicator. And as we've been talking about growing the soil here, I just wanted to kind of give you some, this is a study in nature, I think it was in 2016 as well, that shows graphically uh, in a really fascinating way, I can't get across the detail, you can't even really probably read the organisms involved, but the visual is really the important part. Uh, they also didn't define what recent midterm and long-term is. I believe long-term is 15 years, midterm is five to seven, and recent is like within a uh, months to a year. So you can see the lines designate a direct communicative pathway between different species in the neighborhood to keep the analogy going. So you can see it takes time for the complexity of that neighborhood to, to develop. Um, so it's really important to understand that and, and because if we don't, we really don't generate the patience that we need to get to the, the uh, potential here. And this passage really says it a lot. You know, it's uh, earthworms, fungi, nematodes, mites, springtails, bacteria. It's very busy underground. All soil life together forms one giant society. Under natural circumstances, that is, a large European research team discovered that when you try to restore nature to grasslands, uh, restore nature on grasslands, formerly used as agricultural fields, there's something missing. So all the overarching known groups of soil organisms are present from the start, but the links between them are missing so that they don't socialize. The community isn't ready to support a diverse plant community yet. Not unlike a neighborhood being built, not being able to inhabit human, right? Um, so this was really neat when I read it because it kind of dovetails the analogy that I was offering there. Uh, so when nature restoration progresses, you'll see new species appearing, major groups of soil life remain the same and their links grow stronger. Uh, it's just like the development of human communities. People start to take care of each other and the soil, you can see that organisms use the other's byproducts as food and you can kind of continue and imagine the analogy from there. Um, so, you know, nature can store and use nutrients um, far more efficiently when they're organized. So the idea here is, you know, patience is a virtue. 
Uh, it doesn't happen overnight, but it's not a matter of if it works, it's kind of how it works. Um, so, you know, diversity, balance, um, microbes need to be present to do their work and be patient. So uh, next time we are gonna talk about composting, do's and don'ts, carbon to nitrogen ratios, different methods, things like that. And then uh, for two weeks after that, we'll talk about compost tea uh, before we pivot into uh, kind of biodynamics and the energetic conversation. That's always a fun one. So uh, if there are any questions, I would love to try and answer them.